AJ Barnes and this is Jonathan McKinney. Hello. And you are watching another episode of Writing, Talking and Dog Walking. Yes. Molly keeps seeing squirrels. <laughs> so if I suddenly vanish, it's because Molly Dog is getting very overexcited. Yes. So today we're going to be answering a question. Woo! There she goes. <laughs> that we got on Facebook from L.R. Jones. And it's really hey, working Molly. today. Um, he wants to know some really good examples that we can give of setup yep. and payoff in yep. stories and why they work so well. Yes, so that was unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, we're going to be talking about some examples of setup and payoff and why we like them, but first we'll explain a bit about what we mean by yeah, setup and payoff. Because this prompted a bit of a conversation for us. Yeah, we ended up having a conversation then about what we feel it is and how we feel the term can be applied, what it what it means to us as writers. Yeah. Because I had a slightly different take on it than you. Yes, you did. So tell them what your take on setup and payoff was. I will. Okay. Write. So mine, I always think of the Matrix first and foremost. For everything. Not for everything at all. Um, but um, I think of it a lot. I think of the Matrix for setup and payoff because of the the device that the writers use to include an oracle, literally the oracle. Um, in the middle of the story, which we find out that everybody who is important in the Matrix or whatever, every human that's been freed goes to see her, and everybody who goes to see her gets this little horoscope, a little piece of advice that's just for them. And this leads to a lot of payoff, I think, in the in the last sort of 20, 30 minutes of the film. So what it gets what it boils down to uh, from a more vague and universally applicable point of view is posing a question to the audience via characters in the film or the book um, that you are promising to answer and the reason the matrix is the example I look at is because the questions that get posed to the audience through the, the middle part of that film for example um, is Neo the one is Morpheus going to find the one what did the Oracle tell Trinity and can we even trust the Oracle they all get answered really spectacularly by the end right yeah so essentially that boils down to intrigue and mystery um, and then a good explanation of what What's has happened yeah a good answer to those questions Sorry, just having a having a so that was my first thought yeah whereas mine was not quite as um plot relevant yeah. i think for me set up and payoff is when you essentially um reward your reader or viewer with making something that they might have noticed earlier in the story yeah. relevant to the end. So yes. almost like a series of hints about the actual conclusion. So when you look back over the story, you can see that the the writer has been guiding you towards the conclusion from the beginning. Yes. Um, so so for not, instance, not a massively different No, thing, not massively but different. The examples but are different. The examples are very different. So for instance, um, I'm reading Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone yes. right now with um, our oldest daughter. Yeah. All throughout it, you're getting hints that um, Professor Quirrell is the villain. Right. It's set up that Professor Snape is the villain. Right. And it's Professor Snape who wants to get the Philosopher's Stone out from under Fluffy. And it's, it's Snape who is plotting right. against Harry and trying to hurt Harry. Yeah. My fringe is doing some crazy things right now. Yeah, don't worry about it. Um, but when you actually look through the story, there are all the time Snape is doing something suspicious. Right. Quirrell is present. Right. So you have the fact he wears his strange smelling turban. You have when Snape is in the forest talking to Quirrell about the Philosopher's Stone, it's Quirrell who is there with him. Yeah. You don't hear everything Snape says. Right. Um, when Snape gets his robe set on fire at the Quidditch match because they think he's cursing Harry. Right. When he falls forwards away from the fire, he knocks Quirrell down. Right, and Quirrell, so that has the same impact. Exactly. Every time they stop Snape doing something, it's really Quirrell. Sort of inadvertently stops. Exactly. So if you're Quirrell. paying attention, you would feel that Snape is too obvious a villain. Right. Um, but obviously Rose is six and she's not seeing it. No, no, of course. Um, and I don't think when I was a child I saw it. Well, I only saw, I never read that book. I watched the movie mm. and in the movie, I think it's pretty obvious because the, the turban looks so unnatural. Because they, I suppose they have to be a bit more heavy handed, there's yeah. less time to do it. But in the book, if you pay attention, 
it's guiding you towards the fact it's Quirrell from the start. Right, okay. Which, so when it's revealed and all these things are explained, the payoff for having paid attention to all those hints and clues throughout the story are very satisfying. Okay. And I, I find that sort of thing very satisfying. Yeah. Um, an example from um, film that we talked about when we were working out what we wanted to say about it. Um, in Avengers, the, the final... In Endgame. In Endgame, the final sequence of Endgame has so much payoff... It does. ...for setup that was done films and films and films ago. So, we will we'll spoil it? We'll yeah, have to I mean, the spoiler because... lift. The spoiler lift was lifted, <laughs> officially. So, obviously, Tony Stark dies. Yeah. Um, there, there is a, there is a, a like a, essentially a wreath laid at um, his funeral. At, oh, out onto the lake his, by his house. It's his little circular heart. That she, that um, Pat the, Potts had mounted with proof that Tony Stark has a heart. Yeah. And it's very, very moving. You, but during the fight scene, you've got instant kill mode. Yeah. From Spider-Man: Homecoming. You've got the Wasp saying Cap. With, yeah. She teases Ant-Man about in the Ant-Man film. Because it's like, oh well, we're friends. Yeah. Um, what else is there? Oh, just like, it's it's crazy how often it happens. That oh, on your left when he comes when left. he first course, comes yeah. through the portal, just so many moments. If you have been paying attention yeah. to the earlier films, you're you're rewarded. The payoff for that is incredible. Yeah. The, so the, yeah, for it me, is payoff overload. For and me, that is what I'm talking about. If I say I'm setting up and paying off. It's for you. It's questions that are answered in a satisfying way. The setup of a question. Well, in then, the case of Harry Potter, that is because the question is who is actually working against yeah. him, and what J.K. Rowling does is use Snape as a foil for the actual villain, um, so that the viewer is led to believe, oh, it must be this guy because he all he's all black. He's like from Slytherin, and we've heard they're just bad guys apparently. So, yeah. but yeah, that is still like it there is, is a question because she doesn't. Go out of a way to say it's definitely Snape because then it would yeah, be. Yeah, exactly. Like it but wouldn't work. But I think the best way for me, yeah. for how I feel when I'm writing, if I want to do good payoff, mm -hmm. if I want to use something significant at the end of a story, right? So um, a weapon that is particularly means, useful. The means of defeating the bad guy. Yes, if you have a exactly. bad guy. Exactly. The means of defeating the bad guy, yeah. or the thing that they use to accomplish their dream. Essentially, you don't want it to just feel like you came up with it when you got there. Exactly. Um, so that's how you use the narrative triplets we talked about before. You can um, you can go back and insert these clues. Exactly, and if you put references to whatever it is in earlier, make it relevant, make it significant to the story, but without intruding upon the story. And I think that's the key. You have these things in that are relevant yes, if, and important, but they don't take away your attention. If if this if this is done at a, at a kind of expert level, then you'll have a reason to use the setup in and of itself, so that if it's not setting anything up, it still deserves and needs to be in the story. Exactly. Right? The turban doesn't really. The turban in Harry Potter. Well, it's covering Voldemort's face. I know, but that's the point. Yes. Um, it doesn't have a, a purpose beyond that. So when you see it, it stands out. If you want to use expert setup, then yeah. The, the thing that is setting up your final um, battle or your final act or your or final... Just, yeah, the, the thing that you're going to use... We're we going this way? Uh, we're going that way. And she's okay. going this way. Okay. <laughs> the thing that you're going to use to resolve whatever it is, whether it's the entire story or... A battle or whatever. A battle, whatever. If you find a good use to set that up, so it's story relevant. It's not just a random thing. It is story relevant yeah. from the start. And sure, but you won't always be able to make it story relevant, oh, and that yeah. is okay. You it's can fine. just no, you set don't stuff have, up. Not everything has to be um, perfectly stitched together all the Should time. Oh yeah, but if you can find a reason for a device in your story to pay off at the end, after being story relevant at the beginning for a completely different reason. Yeah. That's just tighter storytelling. It's, it just makes it more satisfying. So, as I say, um, in Harry Potter, all of the events going on with Quirrell yeah. and Snape, they're relevant anyway because it's what's going on with Harry and his relationship to Snape, his thoughts about the Philosopher's Stone, him trying to figure out this mystery that is around them. 
and Snape and Quirrell are having their own battle, but you think it's something different. Sure. So and it's, it's relevant because Harry thinks Quirrell is, is on the same battle as him. Right. So he trusts Quirrell even more. So he, yeah. So, so when it's the payoff and it's the flip, there's, uh, it's there's, satisfying. Yeah, satisfaction is the, is the goal. Yeah, um, I think you can do a lot on this subject because there's so many ways and so many examples. Like um, LR Jones on Facebook was asking for like the best examples and our favorite examples of this. And because good stories are laden, yeah. heavily laden like all the way through with these um, devices that make the story so satisfying and make yeah. the payoff and so excellent. So we could list so many examples. The reason why we talked about the narrative triplet is because when you, when you see something once, that doesn't create expectation. <laughs> when you see something once, it doesn't necessarily create expectation. Yeah. Uh, when you see it twice, though, and you know that there's still a long way to go with your story, that starts to create, whether you're aware of it or not, expectation that you're going to have a resolution to what it is that you're seeing. So, um, yeah, I think we'll do another video, or at least maybe even two, eventually, on this technique and how to satisfy your audience with setup and payoff. With specific examples. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, it's crucial to storytelling. So, yeah. um, it does deserve a lot of Yeah, I agree. Time. So, um, yeah, if you have any questions that you want to ask us, anything you want us to talk about, it's going to be um, ooh, it is going to be tricky. <laughs> um, then um, drop us a comment down there. Um, we will try and get back to every single person. Um, it might take time because we try to record as many videos as we can. Um, but we will try and answer every single question we get. You can also find us on social media. So we're on Instagram and Facebook, which um, again, links in the description. So check those out. And you can find us on Twitter, which is always a great one for talking to people. Bin man. Okay, wrap it up. Turn round. Jonathan. Molly's confused. She is confused. We'll just go back again. We it's need fun. to wrap this up anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm at Judy Ann Rose and he's at John Muck. So come and find us and talk to us there. Um, we're always talking about writing and we're using all the writing hashtags and what we're doing. So um, yeah, Twitter's great for that. So come find us. Yeah. Um, also, if you go to www.sirenstories.co.uk, um, you've got links there to all our books, all our work. Um, we should do a whole video on the setup and payoff we do because. Yeah. Oh, but we're going to be spoiling all our books. Well, we'll set anyway. my homework then. We'll do that because <laughs> um, we love to use this. It's really exciting when you do it well. Yeah, it's the best part of editing as well. It is the best part of Making editing. Making sure that it's tightly constructed from the start. Um, but yeah, on that website, you'll find links to also our podcast where we are doing all of the writing and the story of Lost, uh, which again, the foreshadowing and the, if you want to talk set up and pay off, Lost is an absolute blinder. Um, we have a whole separate... Um, podcast about spoilers of Lost. So we're doing episode by episode. No spoilers on the iTunes and the Google podcasts. But if you want the spoilers, which again, the, the payoff for these setups, which is starting early, 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 early in Lost, that is paid off right the way through. And it's a wonderful to look at and talk about how they do it. So I highly recommend that. Um, it's on Patreon. So it's a dollar a month, it's like 80p a month. Um, and listen to those because it's very satisfying. Um, and watch last for that. Yeah. Um, what else do I need to tell you? I think that's everything. That's everything. So um, yeah, we'll talk to you again in another video. We'll do this again with more examples. It's brilliant. I love this subject. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, come and find us and we'll talk to you again soon. Cool. Bye. Bye.